Schauer from the University of Alberta talking to us about hope raise frequency. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for staying awake so far. <laughs> I'll try to keep it uh, interesting and uh, hopefully uh, I'll still find that uh, this will keep you awake for the next 15 minutes. Uh, my name is Cyrus and I did this research with the first period at the University of Alberta. And, um, I wanted to change the title to n-gram frequency, but I thought that might scare people away, so I left it as whole phrase. But uh, I'd like to also submit that, that you could replace whole phrase with, with whole n-gram, and you wouldn't uh, change the meaning of, of the presentation. Um, so it, it, we have these things called closed tasks, and we're trying to get at with people choosing words, so you have this idea of word choice. Um, when we're choosing words, we have constraints, and I think we all agree that there are uh, there are many things that constrain our choice of words as we use language. Uh, one is, is lexical. That's not a word, so you probably won't say it. Um, but there are a lot of other constraints uh, when you choose words. Uh, for example, there's some syntactic issues with this. Probably doesn't sound like English to most people. But you can sort of guess what they're trying to say, maybe. Um, but uh, that, that definitely would not fall under most English speakers' syntactic constraints. Semantic ones, again, these are all words. Syntax is okay, but uh, semantically doesn't make too much sense. And uh, there, there are much larger constraints in the context of a discussion or a discourse, a narrative. This one probably doesn't make too much sense, uh, even though it, it, it does have perfect semantics and syntax and lexical constraints. So when people fill in the blanks, and people have to fill in the blanks a lot in life, um, there's, there's certain things that will make them choose certain words in these situations. I, I'm a big fan of, of football, so um, I have my own opinion about what to fill in there. I'm sure you all do as well. Uh, but obviously, we're all going to have a, a different opinion when given this, what to, what to fill in there. And that variety is what I got interested in when I did this research. Because in a lot of research on, on words and engrams, it's a lot on comprehension, you know? How long does it take to read this? How, where were your eyes fixated as you read it? But um, in terms of production, producing words, producing engrams, what, 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 what's operating there? That's what I wanted to get at. So it's sort of a different take on, on uh, engrams, but more on the production side. Uh, again, another common thing, you're on the cell phone. Someone you hear, would you like to, you know, phone cuts off. Depending on a lot of information, you have to make a guess, you know, dance, go home, see a movie, be my friend. There are lots of things that, that they could have said at the end of that uh, phrase there. But you, you, you can make guesses, and, and we have to make guesses. We're, part of our job as language comprehenders and producers is we, we guess what's coming up, so we have to sometimes. And sometimes we don't, when we don't even have to guess. So there's a lot of prediction going on, I feel, all the time. And so um, this, this kind of task is interesting, but it's sort of naturalistic in many ways. Now, as I was saying, I, I don't uh, use the word phrases in this presentation, I use engrams. I think engrams gets more at what we're getting at. These aren't um, what we would identify as constituent phrases. Um, they, 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 they're, 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 they're not complete phrases in a grammatical sense. Um, they're basically any uh, set of three, four, or five words, maybe two words, maybe six words. In this case, uh, we'll use three, four, and five in, in, this, in this study I'm going to talk about today. Um, but would you like to is a four word as I'll define it. And so uh, we have word frequency, as we all know, from corpora. We can also get n-gram frequency from corpora. And in this case, um, I'll be taking the n-gram frequency from what's called the Google Web 1T database, which is a free resource that Google created, which basically went through a trillion words of web text and calculated the frequency of the two, three, four, and five grams uh, that they found. So it's a very broad coverage corpus. Um, very uh, uh, big list, for example, you know, there's 333 million free grams. It's a lot of free grams. And there's a, a frequency for each one. So that gives you really lots of information to work with. It's, it's difficult to work with because it's so large, but it's interesting because you can get something that happened only 40 times per trillion, which is very small. But we need that kind of very detailed information to get at this stuff. So my, uh, my, 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 my position I'm going to take is that there's, there's probably something like a familiarity heuristic going on when people are asked to fill in the blanks. 
They're going to fill in with perhaps, because we're not giving them any other context in here. And we're not saying, uh, here's a couple of sentences, uh, John went to the store and Mary wanted to get milk, so he got blank milk, right? That kind of context is not available in this experiment. There's no context except for three words on either side of a blank line, or two words, and so on. So when you have no context, what do you do? And what I think people do is they go for the most familiar word that can fill that slot. And I'm thinking the most familiar word is probably uh, one that they've been exposed to in that slot. So they, they're exposed to engrams. They um, are initially exposed through, through their hearing, through hearing language, and then later on through writing. So I think written frequency and spoken frequency here can be used together a little bit. Um, and I think that the, the written engram frequency, like we have in the Google corpus, is probably related to their familiarity. That's how I'm going to hypothesize. And so I'm hoping that uh, this engram frequency is going to be a predictor of word choice. I made two types of tasks. One is a letter close task, and that was for the three and the four grams. That one, the engram is missing one letter, uh, always the initial letter, but uh, varied across different parts of initial, letter, first word, second word, third word, and so on. There's also for the five grams a uh, word close task where out of the five words, one was blank. So again, it, there, there was a lot of possible choices for what to fill in, but uh, we'll see which ones people pick. Uh, got a very large sample. We have a nice system where uh, we get all the undergrads who take intro psychology to uh, fill in a, a survey. And so I got all 2,100 of them to, uh, to do this for me. Unfortunately, it's a web-based survey, so I have no reaction time data. I can't really speak about reaction time because I don't have any. I can't hypothesize, speculate about it. But it'd be interesting one point to figure that, to look into that as well. But um, we do have all their answers. So it's a large data set without any reaction time to go along with it. And these were the instructions that uh, people uh, did, used. Unfortunately, this final sentence was widely ignored, <laughs> as we shall see. Um, here is the full set of the stimuli. Now, you may say to yourself, wow, that's a small stimuli set. Why couldn't you make it more? And I'll tell you why. Because part of this web survey restriction is you can only get six minutes of their time. So you have 2,100 people, but you only get them for six minutes, right? Not as nice if I had like 1,000 people for 12 minutes, I'd be very happy. But I only have six minutes. So because of that restriction, I got to use this very limited set of uh, letter completions. As you can see, it's these are not really phrases. That's why I said phrase is not a good word. I mean, um, and blank filling in. So, I mean, English native English speakers will, will, will might even sort of like hallucinate an F. If, if, they, if they feel like the F should go there, they hallucinate that. They, they, it's sort of a, it's like a gestalt sort of thing. It just appears out of nowhere, the F, right? Or you can look at all these and you'll see letters appear. If, if you, and even non native speakers are not even, thank you, Karen. Yes, you see it, right? You see the letters. Thank you, Karen. And you're not even a native English speaker. Um, same trick here. Read these. You'll see a word sort of levitate above the blank line. Uh, that's uh, sort of the idea that there's some some attraction to one word. When you see these, you're attracted to it. There's one that, that, that feels like the right one. And so I was trying to see what, what's, what's producing that strange feeling that I get and other people may get when seeing these. Um, and it doesn't have anything to do with n-gram frequency. Sorry about that. That didn't happen at home. It was all in one line. And that's an interesting one because that's really highly constrained, right? As we'll see. So to give you an idea of what we get, uh, here's just the um, corpus data, our, our predictor, is a blank day. So in the Google corpus, out of a trillion times, sad happened 3,887 times per trillion. That's what that number is. Uh, this is most of the and grams that came out. There are 32 more that were lower frequency. So this gives you an idea of the rank. The number one rank was sad and good and beautiful. It's a, it's a sad day, it's a beautiful good day, it's a beautiful day, it's a great day, it's a nice day. So one one sort of uh, emotionally sort of downward and then you get happy after that. So um, <laughs> this is what the web sort of speaks. This is, this is a big average of a trillion web, web words. So this is sort of the, the sort of consensus of a lot of human authors on the internet. Now, here's what I got from my survey data. Again, it's hard to compare these. This is sort of one of the problems with analyzing this kind of data. It's why no one does this research, really, I think, because it's so difficult. You get 381 people who are beautiful. Second rank is nice, sunny, good, hot, great, warm, um, rainy, and so on. But that, that, even though it looks like a similar scale number, it's a very different scale number. 
this is 381 out of 2,110, right? So it's a different scale. And that's why, as I'll explain later, I have to analyze this in a very certain way. But as you can see, you've got crappy, uh, other ones that I won't say out loud, um, stuff that doesn't make sense. It's a bluebird day. Does anyone know what that means? If someone can tell me what that means right now, why is it that? Anyway, you can see, the thing is, uh, intro site. This is what we get, right? So, anyway, um, we have a, a first analysis, which I'll call the family size analysis. And uh, the idea with this, my hypothesis, if there are the memory traces from experiencing spoken and written language of these engrams, and all the completions, all the completions um, a larger variety of engrams in the corpus, because that's where the experience comes from, right? And what you read, what you hear, should translate into a larger variety of experiences and a larger family size of responses. And so, um, the way I got this is I did a rank correlation. I ranked all those stimuli. You saw those uh, three grams and four grams. This is the, 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 the letter close test. This is just when they have to fill in one letter. And so this one is the one that had the smallest or the, the number one ranked family size in uh, the survey responses, it also luckily had the number one ranked family size in the corpus. And so you can see this is not really uh, a really a, uh, a regression line. This is just sort of something visually to give you an idea of how the ranks correlated. But they correlated very, very well using experiment rank correlation. So in this case, the rank of the family size, the, the, big, the smallest family size and the biggest family size were very much correlated between the corpus and the responses. Um, same here with the word close task. Similar, uh, a little bit smaller, that was 0 0.49. And um, so that gave me hope that there was something going on here between the size of the family of the variety of responses that I got from the subjects and the variety of the works. Now, in the second type of analysis, it's, it's a little bit more interesting for me. It's the token frequency uh, type of analysis. And in this type of analysis, the familiarity of the engram. Um, is going to be related to the frequency of exposure. So the more you see something, the more familiar you are, and the more likely you are to fill it in in this plan. This is trying to get exactly why you would uh, go into one uh, one answer. Is it because it's the one you've heard the most? Or is it the one that was most frequent in the corpus, which is sort of our proxy for that? So to give you an idea of how we look at this, uh, this is just sort of a step uh, representation. The green line is the corpus. So in this case, uh, for the, the blank AT is, uh, C was the most popular response. The blue is the response from the subjects. Cat was the most popular response. It was also the number one in the corpus. And then uh, fat was the second in the corpus, but it wasn't the second in the responses. So that goes down below the line. Hat, uh, again, wasn't, it was, the, hat was actually second in the responses, but it was third in the corpus. So you see that there's some mismatch in the ranks, but Overall, the ranks are pretty close. And then when you plot this same data, I'm going to plot the same data using um, the same rank response here. You see it's a very, very nice uh, rank correlation between uh, the corpus and the responses. So this is just for one item. Now, it's, I could show you, you know, 19 more of these kinds of graphs, but instead of doing that, I'll, I'll show you uh, a more condensed item uh, results in one second. Um, this is for nothing or something or blank to do with the nothing was the number one one on the um, survey and also number one on the corpus and then it sort of jumps up and down a lot but again the, uh, if you look at it this way you see that the ranks are very very well correlated you get an extremely uh, strong uh, rank correlation um, so this is the sort of summary of all the items if you do the rank correlations all of them except three were uh, significant, <coughs> and the three that weren't, I'm very interested in finding out why they didn't turn out significant. Why, why the rank correlations were, were not 